Hi, Jane. Thanks for joining me again, friend. Hey, good to see you. So I want to start this conversation by just giving a little bit of context about what I'm wanting to talk about with you. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were on the phone, as we often are, uh, having one of our long phone conversations. And I realized so many of our conversations involve you sharing updates about what's happening in your own practice and me sharing updates about what's happening in my practice and our lives and so on. And usually for you, that involves talking about your body and what's happening in your body. And like so many people on this path, you've really developed a really acute, I think, proprioception and sense of your own inner experience and how to work with that. And I realized that listening to you talk about it, I'd heard about different aspects of your practice and different parts of your body at different times. Like I remember different things that you've said, but they felt sort of isolated. And like, I didn't really have a sense of the whole and what it's like for you to be in your body. And um, I felt the sadness about it. I was just like, oh, my best friend, one of my best friends, there's this aspect of her experience that I just really don't know as much as I'd like to know about that's incredibly important to who she is and how she experiences the world. And um, yeah, I wanted to dive deeper into that. I was like, oh, why don't we record that as a podcast? And you graciously have agreed to play along. So I've been really looking forward to this and uh, yeah, getting to know you better in this way. Um, knowing what your experience of your body and your phenomenology is like. So I'm excited to dive into that. Um, is there anything you'd want to add to that context? No, I don't think so. It just makes me, it made me, and now hearing it again, it makes me feel just like really seen to even be asked that and for you to take the interest in that. I mean, like, I think that it's so much of my experience and what I'm working with all of the time. And I'm always trying to like pare that down a little bit when I talk to people because it's not, <laughs> it's not the way that people normally like share life updates, I guess. Um, so yeah, it, it, I, it hadn't really occurred to me either that we don't, we talk about it a lot, but like, like, you know, there is a level of depth there that I just don't really talk about to anyone. Um, that, uh, feels awesome that you notice that and, um, are curious about it. I'm super excited to see where the conversation goes. So thanks for the Thanks for the care and the interest and the introduction. Of course. It seemed fitting to start just by asking, how are you feeling in your body right now? Yeah. Um, I'm super aware of this spot in my, my chest, like the sort of energetic heart space or right at the bottom kind of where the heart and the solar plexus spaces meet each other like right at the base of my sternum um it's a little like constricted and nervous feeling and I yeah I noticed like a big portion of my awareness is there and I have I have these like pretty intricate maps of my own body that I'm working with all of the time that I'm sort of like always in my body feeling into what's there and then have these sort of like running maps also that I'm always like updating and tracking not not even externally it's just you know I'm just aware of it um so I you know that's not a new thing for me and I, I kind of know what that's about but it's it's still very there I think um let's see and then apart from that I would say the more distributed sense of like a little bit of nervousness mixed with excitement. Where do you feel that? Yeah, I was gonna say everywhere, but I would say mainly like from my feet to that spot in my sternum, just kind of all through there. Hmm. What? What are some major spots in your body that you're often keeping an eye on? Yeah, I would say 
the prominent ones change. There's phases. Um, I would say right now that one that I mentioned at the sternum is um, probably the main one. Um, and I think it's one of my main ones overall. And then I think I go through phases where it's just a little more shrouded, hidden, and I'm only noticing it if something's happening that's really triggering it. Um, and another one that I think is related that tends to be pretty prominent for me is this like back of the neck, base of the skull uh, area. And yeah, they're, they're similar, but slightly different in a felt sense way. They both have to do with fear. And um, this one is a little bit more like a protective shield, I would say, in general. Um, and then the sternum one is is more like the thing that's being protected by this. So it's just, um, aside from like some constriction, it just doesn't feel like it has the same kind of like a way of like plating around it or something. It's more vulnerable. Um, but yeah, I would say I think that those are two of my like hot spots, um, sort of like my holy grails of like, <laughs> of like, um, some people would say like trauma body or pain body, that kind of thing, my energetic body, but in the sense of being protected or being vulnerable or being very triggerable. Um, there's another one that kind of, it's hard to define exactly the limits of it, but I feel it through my core on the right side and all the way up into the right shoulder. And there's some very interesting like unit there that has to do for one thing with how um, right arm dominant I am in life. So I think that like always doing things with my right hand and my right arm versus my left side has has just built in some interesting asymmetries, but then there's like a whole sort of like emotional thing and patterning there that happens around that as well. Um, I could really like talk about anywhere, but I would say like hips, hip, uh, sometimes the right hip is super prominent. Sometimes it's the left hip. And then there's an interesting way that there's like an interaction again with like, which one is actually the one that's more injured or like the one that's protecting the other one more because that can can be like a little bit of a red herring sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's that seems like enough. <laughs> hmm. What was one of the first spots in your body that you started to become aware of or develop insights about? Um I want to say my back because I had really bad back pain. And that was one of the things that got this whole journey started for me. Like it was all soft tissue, which was nice. It was all muscular pain. Um, I wasn't dealing with disc problems or anything, but um, it was really bad. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was so painful all the time and I couldn't really find any relief from it. And that, yeah, I started getting lots of massages that kicked off my whole massage journey, both as a recipient and as a practitioner. Um, so it was sort of, um, yeah, just through crying out for a lot of attention that that, that sort of became the first main spot. How has your experience of your back changed since that time? Does it feel the same or feel different? What's changed, if anything? Yeah, that's such a nice question. Um, it has, in some ways it's changed a lot. In some ways it's barely changed. It's definitely not a prominent spot for me anymore, but it's one that I know that I'm going to come back to eventually. Um, so interestingly, I can't feel my spine very much, which I think... I actually don't know if that's unusual. I was going to say, I bet that's unusual for people in the embodiment space. And it just seems like 
in terms of feeling into your body, the spine is so prominent and important um, that it feels like something that I should have this very deep felt relationship with, um, but I don't. And um, and then some of the tissues of my back, especially my low back, like there is a word that I'll probably use a lot in this conversation, which is dense. And I, a lot of the tissues in my low back feel very dense to me, especially on the right side. And what I mean by that is like the way that I experience a lot of my body is like this very sort of like alive feeling alive from the inside or alive in its own awareness or yeah, like alive in a sort of cellular awareness way, I think. And when they don't feel like that, they feel dense to me. And it's it's hard to describe what I mean. Like, I can feel it when I touch my own tissue or somebody else's. And like, it's like a very opaque, um, not dead, but it doesn't have that alive feeling. It might just feel dark and quiet and um, confusing and hard to... Yeah, that's what I mean by opaque, like hard to get insight into, because normally when I touch somebody's tissues, it feels maybe like healthier or more alive or something. I feel like I get a lot of information from them. And with these with this quality of denseness, it there is like tends to be a lot less information that feels available. So I would say that in my back, um, a lot of those low back tissues feel super dense, especially on the right side. And I just know that there's a lot that needs to happen there at some point and then I think that like as those tissues start to clear out like the spine will um will do the same will follow suit and um yeah I'll have more like flexibility in my spine um and I just really trust my body to figure out the order of the way that this process is happening. And I, I can tell that that is a later thing. Um, I still, you know, sometimes I just like, I do a lot of self-touch stuff all the time. It's a huge part of my, my practice. And I still, you know, like to touch those tissues, like my, my QL, my quadratus lumborum on the right side. Um, yeah, I'll just like touch that a lot and like be curious and see if I can see things, but I'm not um, actively spending a lot of time there. And I don't think it would be productive to do so. And I think it might just, um, it might be counterproductive. Like I took a yoga class um, some number of months ago and there were backbends in the class. And I was like, oh, I can't do backbends. I'm not gonna do this. I'm just gonna sit sit out this part and watch. And then I was like, uh, fuck it. I'll just like try, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it really slow slowly and like not hurt myself and maybe I can do it and then I and then I did it and I actually did it like pretty easily and I was so surprised and so I just like hung out in the back bend like did it for kind of a while it's like oh this is so cool like it felt really nice to have that that new range of motion that I I don't think I had had for I don't know how long I hadn't had it but I think years before that and then <laughs> and then after the class there was a price to pay not in terms of like um, physical injury or anything, but it was like massively triggering um, emotionally. And it just sort of was way beyond a level that I could effectively work with. And so then, yeah, there was like a little bit of a spiral. And then, you know, I have plenty of experience with that. And I worked with that and got through it. But it was just like, didn't, didn't need to happen, didn't need to push those tissues that way. And so, um, I have, I think I have a way of sensing into what I'm working with and what's an effective way to, what part of my body I'm working with and what's an effective way to work with it and what's a sort of like the right dosage and what kind of momentum I want to bring into working with it. And um, yeah, that's always a little bit of like an equation and a dance and sometimes it's just uh, a little off. you still experience back pain? Um, I experience a lot 
of pain in my body (laughs) like because I am so much more aware now like it was a really load-bearing thing to just be pretty numbed out um and so inviting all of that feeling back in was certainly the right thing to do and it's like um it's like really my path it makes so much sense that um I'm on this path and I feel like I really understand why I am. And also it just brought up so much stuff that, you know, takes a long time to work with and, you know, years to um, go through all of this. And I think it's like my project or one of my, one of my big projects is just finding ways over and over to give my body what it needs. And, um, go my own way with it other people's programs like more often than not I can get bits and pieces and stuff but more often than not it's like something that I need to be figuring out how to do and so it just means that all of those places that were neglected for a long time and that there is a lot of sort of debt built up and um you know stuff I didn't not to not do uh not to blame myself you know stuff I didn't know how to work with before but yeah there's a lot of pain in general um to work with all the time I would say that the back pain has lessened a lot but I also just don't have to sit as much as I used to I used to sit for work and so I yeah sat in a desk chair for hours every day and um also did a lot of long drives and stuff like if I I do a long drive now it will hurt my back and I just have better ways of mitigating that now um yeah but that's still like um, one huge milestone on this project for me will be when I am able to sit comfortably. Like that will be such a beautiful day <laughs> because I, um, I have, I just got this like yoga ball desk chair. So it's a yoga ball, like inserted into a, a, a chair skeleton thing. Um, and it's probably the best seating situation I've had in the last couple of years it's like this is about as comfortable as it gets for me sitting and it's still like uh you know less comfortable Uh, yeah I I I kind of prefer to be like up walking around moving or like laying on my back um if if possible so um I would say the ways that my back hurts have also changed and improved so like yeah, the pain level has gone down. Um, There's a lot more awareness of where it hurts and a lot of ideas kind of like brewing all the time about what's going on there. And I I really like, I mentioned the back of my neck before and I have been growing in awareness of the connection between that and sort of the the base of the, the spine. So how the two ends of the spine interact with each other and what I can do to like improve that relationship and um, how how I can work on myself with touch to um, support them. And um, yeah. What, if any parts of your body are in pain right now? Hmm. My hips feel, hmm what would be the right word for it? Like, I don't know, kind of generally antsy, uncomfortable, and a little bit like scrunched near the joint. Um, My throat feels, I can hear it in my voice too. It feels a little constricted and, um, a little bit like there are rocks in it or something um but aside from that I actually don't feel I don't feel much pain right now that I'm aware of aside from a little bit I wouldn't call it hypervigilance but like a lot of awareness of what's happening around me from a sensory perspective of like stuff happening in the house and like um my own it's like a little bit of background planning of what to do if something happens. It's this like, yeah, certain like sensory stuff that I'm always sort of background tracking.
I'm imagining that there are these different hot spots in your body that you pay attention to and that each hot spot is a little different and there's different things that you're keeping an eye on and maybe ways that you're paying attention to them, but that there's also commonalities in how you pay attention to these different hot spots. And I'm curious about that. If like how you would describe generally what it means for you to pay attention to a hotspot over time, kind of regardless of the specific content or area of that body or what it means thematically to you or something like that. That's an interesting question. I've never thought about that because I'm never, I'm never really thinking about how I'm tracking stuff. I'm just doing it. Um, and I actually did at some point start taking notes of like my long-term tension patterns, thinking that it might be useful for me or for other people down the line. And so at some point I did start externally tracking it, but so let me repeat the question back to you to make sure I have it right. So it's like, what does it mean for me generally to sort of like track one of these hotspots um, versus the specifics of it? That's right. I think that, um, so I sort of see myself as a researcher in a lot of ways. Um, this is a more recent realization that I think that one of the main things that I'm doing is researching bodies. Um, my own body and bodies of people, clients that I work with, energy work and body work. And then also just people that I interact with all the time, my friends, you know, uh, people, random people that I interact with. I, I like pick up a lot of body information all the time. And I just do a lot of natural pattern matching. I think that that's something that I'm pretty good at and that is pretty in a lot of ways, effortless for me, or maybe not even effortless. It's just like something that's like really joyful for me. It's really like, I was thinking about this once. I think some people could see it, could mistake it for rumination, but it's a way that it's very like erosy and fun and creative for me. It's a way that I'm doing a lot of, um, holding as sort of a background inquiry um these types of questions and observations and noticings about bodies and then there's just all of this pattern matching sort of happening and that feels very effortless to me and really fun and interesting and juicy um and then I feel like the way that my memory works is kind of interesting and unusual and sometimes inconvenient but like it works great for me now that I know how to work with it more like when I was trying to do other types of things with my life. I feel like my memory was not as well aligned. And so it was always like, why can't I remember the stuff that I'm supposed to remember? But now it's like, oh, because I was not doing the right stuff. And now my memory works perfectly for what I'm supposed to be doing. So like my memory, I think actually works quite well for this specific type of tracking, which is why I feel like I could tell you, you know, like all of these long histories about every individual part of my body, even though I've never written most of it down or talked to anybody about it. Um, um, so it's sort of this effortless, just noticing and pattern matching that's happening all of the time. And then there's some kind of internal register that just gets updated all of the time about, um, what's happening in different parts. And, I think it sort of just stays with me when that part stays really active. And like, the, like if it's in my awareness at some um, meaningful percentage, like let's say just like, this isn't just an example. It's like 30% of my awareness for three days in a, in a row or like big parts of those days. Um, you know, then I will just sort of with it have, with that awareness, have this sort of like floating um, awareness of like the history of that and like the story of it that I'm always sort of developing and changing and rewriting and throwing out or not throwing out or talking about to friends and making, making more um, meaning connections out of. Um, so I think it's just I think it's all sort of just this beautiful intelligence of the process itself is that like 
I'm really trying to just follow the cues with my body of like, okay, now it's time to work on this thing. And then my memory works in such a way that I, I just sort of have that register and body of information, that sort of body of work available to me. It has been really cool lately to like, I've been doing way more mapping lately than I ever did in terms of actually noting stuff down. I mean, I've always loved to talk to friends about this when I have friends, body workers, those types of people. <laughs> when I go to see a body worker and, you know, at the beginning, they'll be like, what's going on with your body? And I'm like, buckle up. Let me tell you, <laughs> we could just do this for the whole session. We don't even need to do body work. I could just tell you about my body for two hours. Um, no, not really, but it's like, ah, oh, how do I condense everything into two minutes or something? But yeah, it's been really cool to like, I think as I've realized more, it's like dawned on me more that this is, there is a reason for all of this and that disseminating this will be important. And I'm, I'm good at this sort of pattern matching and I'm good at putting, because a lot of this phenomena is super subtle and hard to put into words. And I think that's why more people don't do it. Um, it's it's just become clear to me that um, having a lot of notes and maps is going to be really useful. So I've been doing it a lot more lately, and that's been really cool to like see visually an external um, collection of some of these, yeah, some of these bodies that I've just been bodies of work about my body that have been floating around in my body and awareness all this time. Um, yeah. And then, and then not just my body and my awareness, but sort of in the energy and like the memory of my relationships and stuff, you know, because I do, I don't, I don't talk to people at the level of depth that, you know, we have so far. I don't usually like monologue to my friends for 30 minutes about, about my body, but a lot of this stuff, because it's such an integral part of the way that I experience reality and what's important to me in life, like, yeah, with my really good friends, it, it it's we're you know it's it's very relevant to the conversation so I would say it like has kind of lived in my body and awareness and relationships and little, little notes and journals here and there but now it's going more into organized external maps hmm. can I take a stab at reflecting what you just said back and see if it sounds right yeah um in very broad strokes, what I just heard was you are always feeling your body and you're keeping an eye on different hot spots and oftentimes those hot spots will come up for say several days in a row or cyclically or something like that and if you notice them being in your awareness, in your awareness, you are curious about that, and you, over time, remember different experiences that you had with that part of your body, and what memories you have of it, and how you worked on it yourself, and with other body workers, and you know maybe what emotions or interpersonal stuff have been associated with that, or memories, and that you're always updating your models of what's happening in those specific parts of your body and telling yourself accounts of what's happening there. And then lately you've been trying more and more to externalize those models and write them down and share them with people. Yeah, totally. That sounds like a really nice summary. And I think I would just add that, not add, as in you missed this, but add to what I said before that like, um, I guess I've been at this for about two and a half years now. And it's been um, one of the really beautiful, rewarding things about having been at it for this long is that like everything deepens over time with these awarenesses, insights, patterns, um, maps, stories, narratives, meaning making. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when I, maybe if I, when I first started working with something, I would get this release and be like, oh, I healed something. And I would, it would feel really good, you know, like I sort of like got 
something back in that part of my body, whether it was functionality or um, feeling or whatever. And, and then maybe that turned out to sort of be the tip of an iceberg. And then, you know, so it came back later. And then I was working with it again and at a deeper layer or just a different part of it or something that's happened a lot. Like I mentioned at the beginning, that back of the neck thing, sort of protective over that base of the sternum thing. Like that was a pretty recent realization for me. And um, I mean, I, I might have guessed it before that, you know, it wouldn't have been that big of a stretch to wonder if those two were connected, but actually feeling it and then getting all of these um somatic insights into how and why those two are connected um was a really recent thing for me and you know and then the map gets updated and the the internal model gets updated um so yeah it i guess it would have been interesting if i had started making external maps from the very beginning to see how much the maps changed over time but um it's it's been, yeah, it's just been so fun to like, it really is like developing a relationship. And I mean, I know that that's a little dualistic or something. Like I'm not, I'm not separate from my body. I'm not a separate thing to be in relationship with my body. I am my body, but there is, it's so beautiful and rewarding and fun for me. And like, yeah, probably like one of the most fun things in life for me to keep deepening into that all the time. And it's not, it's not linear, but it is linear over time. Um, uh, like zo in a zoomed out way it's very it's very uh it's very much deepening with time all the time and so um yeah it's just so cool how all of that has grown so much in richness and um realizing the connections between stuff like I would say that a lot of what I work with these days is hard to talk about as like a hot spot or something because it'll be feeling in certain tissues and I wouldn't even be able to tell you which which tissue whether it's muscular or fascial or both or um probably anything that distributed is a lot of everything but like you know it might be like understanding in a new way how something runs from my shoulder all the way through my core involves my hips and then goes all the way down my right leg you know and like Whereas at the beginning, I might have been working more with like, what's this thing on the left side of my heart, you know? Um, so, yeah, I would say that over time, the maps have um, changed and deepened and um, consolidated a lot. Hmm. One of the things I heard just now is that it's less like a specific hotspot and more of a series of relationships across different body parts and aspects of your body. I think it's both. I think it's both. And, um, and that also points a little bit at the like ineffability of it or the um, impossibility of mapping it or naming it specifically. Um, like, Maybe there's something in one part of the body that feels like it has a very specific um, sort of like meaning gravity attached to it. Um, and it's like, there's all of this metaphor around that specific thing and how it plays out in my life um, sort of thematically. And then I re like, and maybe that's true of some other part of my body also. And then at some point I realized how connected they are, even if like, they still have their really individual stories too. Um, and then I feel like that's like two levels. And then what if there's like 18 more levels in there, you know, and it's all a little hazy and um, can't like make clean lines or anything, but yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I, th I think it might be a useful one to mention explicitly, which is, I think this conversation presents an interesting challenge for me as an interviewer and a conversationalist of, um, I like to think about ordering questions and uh, it's not obvious to me how to order the questions that I really wanna ask. And um, the especially sort of this next 
sequence and it's like i want to get a sense of your internal map of your body and and like go deeper into some of the stories around specific parts and i could imagine doing it chronologically like we started with your back and i could imagine doing it anatomically like in some you know left to right top to bottom type order um but i think the order that feels best actually is sort of ladies choice and what i would love for you to do is maybe pick a part of your body that's been one of these kind of hot spots that you've paid attention to and maybe yeah dive into it as deeply as you can and just share the history of that part and what that's been like for you um what if I don't know how localized you meant by hotspot, but could I do one that's a little bit like upper body, lower body? Sure. Like upper body versus lower body. Um, so it's kind of a, a pretty big one, but I would say, um, let's see, do I want to talk about that one? I always want to be like a little bit, um, I want to be intentional with how I talk about details of certain things. Yeah. Uh, so this one is like really fresh because there was a lot of recent insight into it, but, um, and then it just had me wondering about this wider pattern and I haven't, I haven't even put this into words yet or said it to anybody, but, um, it might be fun to flesh out a little bit and then maybe, yeah, maybe as I talk about it, another, uh, more specific example will come up, but like, so I've had a lot of stuff going on in my legs that I've noticed for a long time. Like there's something weird and super dense going on with my calves. Um, I feel it in my hamstrings also. And it really affects my flexibility. So I would feel that, for example, if I like hinge at the waist and touch my toes. I mean, I can still, I still have pretty good flexibility, but like, Ooh, here's how it really has come up. Um, I couldn't really do, I don't really do massage anymore, but when I was doing massage, it really affected my ability to do a massage lunge, which is really important. It's one of the main stances and it's really important in massage to get the mechanics right or else you are hurting yourself. And I was always hurting my lower back a little bit when I did massages and I couldn't ever quite figure out like what I was doing wrong and then I worked at a place that had some really talented therapists and one time we just did a session messing around like three of us who worked there um it's really fun if you get three like body workers together to like have one person get on the table and then the other two people can just like mess around with them and like show each other things and um it's always always tends to be a really nice um sort of learning space for body work so we were doing something like that and I was asking them like can you guys take a look at my or the the person standing at least can you take a look at my body mechanics and see what you think is going on and she looked and right away was like oh you're not lunging deep enough it was like so obvious to her and I was like I had been doing massage for so long at that point I was like I can't believe no one has like pointed this out to me before that's <laughs> um it seemed obvious when she said it, but she was like, yeah, if you, because you're not lunging deep enough, you're having to like hinge a little bit more at your waist and that's why your low back is bothering you. Um, and I realized that I couldn't lunge deeper because of my cap flexibility. Um, so I was kind of like, well, where does that leave me with massage? Um, I mean, I, I knew that I could over time develop my calf flexibility, but it didn't feel like I could go home and do some yoga, some like calf stretches, and then that would fix it. Like nothing, nothing in my body is that simple. And like, I am, I think I'm past the point of just responding to like normal body interventions like that. Like maybe I'll get a, a little bit of mileage out of it, but everything for me just seems to be this like incredibly imaginal emotional um archetypal story that's playing out so it's like maybe my calves will become more flexible next week or maybe it'll be 10 years from now and I don't feel like I can really have much say in that so um I also don't my sense with it is that it's not muscular in my calves or it's not just mus muscular I, my sense is that it's fascial and I um yeah I don't I don't um I don't know of like 
fascial flexibility interventions as much as muscular stuff. That stuff is just more popular. But anyway, um, so I have this stuff in my calves and my legs in general that will like flare up sometimes all the way up into my hips. And um, it's like I mentioned, the, the calf stuff is so dense feeling. It's like, again, I don't have a lot of awareness into what's there. It just doesn't feel like it's time yet. And so it's this very sort of like dark, heavy feeling in terms of my internal awareness there. I don't feel like I know my calves super well. I don't feel like I have a sense of what they are doing in the world and what they want out of life. And um, I have like a lot of ankle stuff from playing soccer and rolling my ankles a lot, like spraining my ankles a lot and that sort of cascades. So the whole lower body project is a whole huge project that I think I think one day, I really think one day that like a lot of my, um, I think my flat feet won't be so flat anymore. I think my ankles will be more flexible. I think my right hip, which is the reason or not the, like it's, it's a big thing in why I can't sit comfortably. I think like, I think all of this will open up eventually, but I, I think it's a really long-term project. Okay. So there's that piece of that. Recently, what was the really big insight for me, I wouldn't even be able to tell really when that stuff would particularly flare up what was going on with it. Like usually if certain tissues are in pain, I can kind of go home and do my process around what's going on here and how can I work with it. Um, you know, and I have various tools in my toolkit for how I do that. But with the calf stuff, like maybe it would be a conversation that I have with somebody and that stuff would flare up really heavily. And I just wouldn't really feel like I could do anything about it. And I kind of would just have to wait for that to, to pass. And I would try to support it and do some of my movement stuff or meditative stuff. And, um, just couldn't really like move towards resolution with it. So recently I started not related to body stuff. I started getting interested in, um, planetary energy. Like I've been getting interested in astrology and learning about astrology. And I hear astrologers talk about praying to the planets um, directly and like to a specific planet with a specific intention or focus. And I do a lot of deity practice. So that um, intrigued me. And um, so I have experience um, connecting with specific spirits and energies, um, but not planetary ones. So was sort of a, a, a new thing that I was going to try. And there are specific days and times of day when you can, that are particularly auspicious for connecting with certain planetary energies. So I actually had an intuition that I should try connecting with Mars energy. Like I was doing an astrology consultation with somebody and we were talking about Mars in my chart and something happened very prominently in my awareness. It was actually like all of a sudden I just wanted to cry and I, I wasn't sure why. And I, I mentioned to the person, I, the, the astrologer, I was like, oh, that was really emotional. I'm not sure what that is. She was like, do you want to talk about it? And my intuition was like, no, no, this is a later thing. Figure this out later. And she was like, yeah, maybe spend some time with Mars. Maybe that'll. And when she said that, I, again, just had an intuition like, OK, yeah, that's the thing. So I, um, using this like guide that, um, an astrologer wrote and put out about planetary prayer specifics, I sort of set up the container for an auspicious time to connect with Mars day, time of day, um, other things to do to sort of cultivate that container. And, um, it was so interesting. It was like just this incredibly informative experience in terms of, this energy that I felt from Mars when I specifically intended on connecting with Mars. Um, I'm trying to think about how I want to explain this. It's like I have all of these frameworks that have been building in these maps that I'm describing to you that are like very somatic and very emotional. And um, those really blend together, but often with emotional stuff, one of the things that I'm doing is getting really good 
and really precise with um, recognizing and naming individual energy signatures. Um, and not just, I guess, naming and recognizing them in service of not being inside of them without realizing it, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, I can kind of like, whether it's with me or with the client that I'm working with, I can notice that that energy is there without accidentally getting stuck inside of it. Um, and so before I go into what the Mars energy felt like, I would just say that um, I had this whole relationship to the idea of, or not the idea of, but um, relationship to anger and like where I was in my process with um, processing anger, relating to other people's anger, relating to my own anger, how much of my own anger I had processed, how much was still in my body. Um, what I took the anger and energy signature to be, um, how I expressed anger. Um, yeah, how I experience anger. And then that just like totally got updated and shifted things around when I connected with this Mars energy. Um, so what happened when I like started the prayer and opened the container was I immediately felt this like huge blast of energy. It was really like Mars just showed up and sat down at the table across from me, like inter energetic or like even more than that, like more than I would feel the energy of a person across from me. It was like, so it was just this big like burst that came up and was like, hi, Jane, you called <laughs> basically. Um, and part of why I think that that showed up so prominently is because it, it didn't feel like me. It felt like a separate energy. Whereas like I have since connected with other planetary energies like Mercury. I did one of these with Mercury and it was kind of like, oh, there's Jane. That's just Jane. I know that. <laughs> it's like another Jane showing up or like part of Jane, a big part of Jane. Um, whereas the Mars one was like this other being. Um, and I got so much insight from that interaction because um, by having it there, in such a big dosage too, like there's something energetically where adding a bunch of energy to the system gives all this new momentum and like stuff that maybe felt more subtle before it gets like lit up more. Like, I think this is part of the reason why energy work and body work can be so effective is because you're adding all of this energy of the practitioner to the system and things light up way more. Um, and so I'm like self-conscious about how long this story has become, but um, it really, the point of it is how much it sort of updated my system about what anger is and what action is and how closely related those two energies are. And like maybe the signature to me of this Mars energy included both of those things. And I had never felt such a strong connection between an anger energy and an action energy like just a purely not an angry action but just purely like action movement decisiveness boldness um not hurrying but like um what's that thing that I've heard you like don't rush don't hesitate um and then the other really interesting thing about that interaction with that energy was the way that my body responded and my tissues responded. It was like all of that stuff that I mentioned in my lower body, my calves, through my thighs and into my, my hips really responded to the presence of that energy. And they responded with the type of pain and flare up that I was talking about before. So it was like a shutting down in response to that energy. But there was also an attraction to the energy. It was almost like a, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing to say, it was almost like a sexual attraction. So it was like uh, uh, shutting down and sexual attraction, but like in a um, sort of like a submissive thing, like a hierarchical thing. It was like attracted to it, but thinking it was like 
it knew better than me. Um, it knew what to do and I didn't know what to do. It was the leader. I was the follower, that kind of thing. Um, and so I felt like whether I was the one initiating all of these stages of the, the insights or whatever, or whether it was the, you know, Mars was working with me or we were working together or whatever, like I got to feel, oh, this is what those tissues in my body are responding to. It's like a response to this type of fiery, decisive, bold action. And the response is to shut down, like stop moving, go lay down, collapse, not be a part of it, get away from it. And then I could also really feel into how that affects um, my ability to take action because I had never noticed, you know, with collapse comes the absence of energy. I mean, the absence of action. It's like I had never noticed that the anger and the action energy are so closely tied before. Like I knew that anger, the expression of anger involved action, but I guess I didn't. Um, now it feels more to me like all action energies are related to anger energies just a little like different flavors or something of a really similar energy and so then the attraction part um I just like really let myself feel into that like just you know went for it like didn't judge myself didn't hold back like just let myself feel all of that completely and then you know I think of what a lot of attraction is is like a desire to embody that energy of that being or the energy itself or whatever it is the thing that we're attracted to it's like some part of myself that wants to come online and that's where the attraction is coming from um so I could feel into um what would it be like to I felt into the fear first kind of felt through that and then the attraction and the like what's it like to embody that energy um sort of again because there was such a big blast of it that was a little easier to just be like let myself allow this energy into me in in a way of like stepping into it sort of choosing it instead of choosing the collapse resistance action and it felt so good and so like wow I'm missing this a lot and this is something that really holds me back day to day and this is part of why I'm tired a lot and not getting as much done as I would like, even though I have things I really want to do and I'm excited to do. And my legs have felt so much better since then. It was like this huge puzzle piece to that puzzle of um, what was going on in those tissues that I wasn't aware of and what was going on in certain relationships with certain people that like have a lot of that Mars energy. Like whether it comes out as fiery anger or whether it just comes out as like really bold action or something, there was a way that I would like it was like a lot for me, but also, you know, I just like, um, fell into an energetic thing where like they were the leader and I would follow them. Um, and so there was this whole like beautiful cycle and integration process, um, that happened. And I don't know that I would have gotten that in just my sort of like typical somatic emotional processes. That was this really wonderful gift of the astrological context and the planetary energy context that brought all of that together for me and then the thing I mentioned at the beginning of this long ass story is that like there's something I've been wondering as I've been integrating that about um this upper body lower body thing like I feel like this is a pretty common thing with people where their upper bodies are a little more just like ah, I have this heart energy. I have this desire. I'm ready. Like my mind is ready. There's a plan. Let's fucking go. And the lower body is like, no, this isn't safe. I want to stay home. I want to stay in bed. I want to, I want to like, this seems true to me with a lot of people that there's more heaviness and hesitation and, um, the, the upper body is moving faster than the lower body is my sense with quite a few people. And what I've been wondering about is like, I wonder if this is how some people get into really like ungrounded manic kinds of energies is when they have this upper body, lower body disconnect where the lower body has more um, 
concern for safety that's not being addressed or more collapse happening in the lower body and the upper body is just like super ready to go and ready for action. And um, when the upper body is moving faster than the lower body, whether that's the entire upper body or even just gets to be like maybe the head, the ideas, the intellect is like driving some action. I, I'm wondering if that is part of what turns into this heady, hypomanic type of energy that I imagine people listening to this will be somewhat familiar with. Um, oof. <laughs> Is there another hotspot or area of your body you'd like to talk about? Can you handle any more? <laughs> I'm here. Let's go. Um, I don't know if there's any one that I want to talk about in a lot of detail, but um, this thing in the base of my sternum, um, oh yeah, that actually feels like along with my back, they sort of jointly kicked off this whole process for me. And I mean, there are a million things all happening at the same time, I think conspiring to bring me down this path but so I had the really bad back pain and I also I think I've even talked about this on your podcast before I also was having these like panic responses to loud noises specifically my dog barking and um that got traced I started working with a massage therapist for my back and um a shadow work person for the panic stuff and yeah these were my first real like body-based interventions in the sense of digging deeper than just um working with physical structures working with emotional stuff as well and connecting in more to like my internal sense of my body and, and um so yeah that spot at the base of the sternum in one sense it feels like the holy grail spot which is cool because it also was such an important part of how this all started i feel like there's a real beauty and symmetry to that it is like yeah the way in is also going to be like one of the final pieces and it's been very gradual and there have been long periods where it wasn't really on my radar but lately it's been super on my radar and a lot's been happening there and very, you know, chipping away at it all the time, getting to know it better all the time, releasing more of the armoring all the time. Um, and what do I want to say about it? It's like, so there's a pretty big fear there and I don't hear people talking about fear in the heart very often. You know, a lot of people who do this kind of exploration like to map it or, you know, consume maps or create maps. And you see a lot of the same patterns often for different chakras or different parts of the body in terms of emotional mapping. And people talk about fear in certain parts of the body, but I don't hear about it fear in the heart being talked about very much which is interesting because it's so it's so prominent for me there with this specific um I like to call them like energy wounds or I've heard energetic spits before um I guess you could really call it anything I don't I don't think I even like say this out loud very much so I don't even use that phrase that often but let's call it an energy wound um I don't know if this is the same thing, but I have a funny thing that's been happening 
pretty much as long as I can remember that I've only started to make sense of in the last couple of years. But as long as I can remember in my life, I've had moments here and there where I have one heartbeat that feels really anxious or panicked. And the one before it is totally normal. And the one after it is totally normal. <laughs> like, So that has been happening since I was a kid. And I would be like, like what what just happened am I dying am I having a heart attack but then it's gone did I even feel that what was that did I make that up and you know maybe I don't know it didn't happen often maybe it would be once a year maybe even less than that I don't know but you know it's been a consistent thing that I've remembered throughout my life and um it happens more now or I'm more aware of it now and I have um I feel like I might lose some people with this but it's a very big part of my experience and I don't really want to like I don't like I don't like being in hiding about stuff that I've just had so much confirmation about it at this point that like you know it's a it's it's basically like a part of my model at this point I just don't talk about it very much because to a lot of people it sounds like super out there but um now sometimes when I get that random anxious heartbeat I can tell that it's a specific relationship in my life that that's coming through um specific person and it's it's multiple people that this happens with a specific person will think about me and there's something in our connection that has this like um nervous quality to it that um they're thinking about me will have that effect on my heart um and I can feel a lot of people thinking about me um, and I feel it in different ways. Sometimes it's like they just sort of like appear in my awareness suddenly and I'll be like, oh, I wonder what they're doing here. It clearly wasn't like I just started thinking about them because it makes sense for me to. They just appear there and then I'll get a text from them like a minute later, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and other times I think it might be like a more neutral feeling in the heart or something and... Yeah, it's like a pretty stable part of my model at this point that our hearts are just very connected. Maybe maybe everybody, you know, but especially the people that we're in close connection with. And so if you develop enough sensitivity, you can feel feel these things, feel people thinking about you, um, feel people um, work through things <laughs> in their relationship with you. So they affect like the way that that energy of the relationship is held. And then that um, sort of is felt on this side as well. So that's one way that that um, anxious heartbeat shows up for me. But then I think it also like, I also just have an energetic wound there that is very much about fear. And I think like, if, if we have core wounds, core attachment wounds, core energy wounds, um, some kind of core of like the pain body or the trauma body or whatever, I think this is mine. Um, so I think there is some core fear of disconnection that I have or, um, yeah. What is it? I've actually been working with different specific phrases and stuff just the last couple of days. So I actually am being a little like coy, but I actually feel like I know very clearly what it is. It's like fear of losing everyone that I love and being alone forever. And um, the specific things that bring up that fear. Um, you know, I've got, I've got my own versions of that for, for reasons. Um, it's like looking really foolish in front of everybody, you know, whatever everybody is, my scene or the world or people who, whose approval I want, that sort of thing, looking really foolish, um, or coming across as really dumb, not knowing what I, what I'm talking about. Um, those are the main things that trigger that core wound or energy wound in that spot and um 
<laughs> but then why does my dog barking trigger it? <laughs> um, that doesn't that doesn't do the foolishness thing. It is, I think, just there is something. If I understood like the science of noise, that oh maybe I should like maybe I should get like a crash course on. <laughs> on noise <laughs> because there's something energetically that happens with the specific noise that she makes and the volume and like the quality of the sound and happens way more when we're indoors like I can be at a dog park and dogs are barking and it's fine you know but like there's a certain equation to what the conditions are where like her barking or There are any, there aren't, I can't really think of other sounds that do it, but there probably are, um, will trigger, I think it hits me energetically. It's like that sound, my, yeah, my, my sense of it is like that sound moving through my field or through my body and like coming out the other side. And it's so disruptive to that particular energetic structure, the sound, um, that it, it's too triggering. It's like my body can't handle what that disruption will bring up for me emotionally. And so it it finds ways to constrict around it and shut it out and not, not allow that um, wound to be felt. And one of the ways I think is like developing a very thick armor, um, energetic armor kind of around the back of my neck. And there's something about being able to do this kind of movement if somebody's listening and not watching it's like raising my shoulders lowering my head into my shoulders and tightening the muscles um of like my neck and my upper back and shoulders um and it forms this sort of wall that somehow um i think helps protect that base of sternum spot um And then I think there's also like, there's also other um, things going on with that spot at the back of the neck. I think like part of this energy stuff being immaterial is like it all layers on top of each other too, is my sense of it. So I find that there are other energy shapes and structures and meanings that layer on top of that. It's not just a wall there to protect this spot in my chest. It does that, but then there's other energetic stuff and and physical stuff I mean not to you know I'm still a person moving around in the world doing things and doing repetitive movements and using my physical body obviously all the time to do things and so all of that layers in as well to all of this immaterial energetic stuff but um that feels like that feels like a decent overview um for that spot and kind of how it gets triggered and what's there that I'm aware of so far. Um, I mean, yeah, it's been a whole journey to get to the understanding of it that I just shared and it's still there. It's not cleared completely, but um, yeah, it's come up in like multiple situations you know some people are so good at reading energy and sensing into these things that they can sort of find that spot for me pretty quickly and sense into it and tell me things and I worked with a body worker once who I brought it up when he was working on me but he was really sensitive I mean he's been doing it forever he also is a meditator and like he said something to me like I think that is your wound spot and it's also your magic spot, something, something to that effect. And then somebody that I um, got Reiki from recently, she said, like, you have this really beautiful connection between your heart and your solar plexus. Like, does that, does that resonate? Do you know, do you know about that connection? <laughs> and I was kind of like, ah, oh, that's a spot I'm always working on. It's not like, it's not like there yet, but. And she said, like, oh, yeah, sometimes I see stuff before it, like, really fully materializes or comes into being or something. But it's just, it's like this beautiful thing there between the heart and the solar plexus. Um, and I have also felt that imaginally. Um, one time, 
uh, I was hosting this really cool deaf event and we did these imaginal journeys uh, on various <laughs> death topics, um, death related topics. And my journey ended up being with this part of my body. Mine are always extremely body based. Not surprisingly, and I saw it sort of as this incredibly beautiful like crystal garden or something and it was just so gorgeous and colorful and lush and like joyful and it felt like the Akashic records of my being it was like it held all of the secrets of everything it held the entire plan of like my life and my purpose and it it was like asking me to spend more time with it because it had it just had so much for me and it wasn't unlocked yet and it wanted to be unlocked and it's like it just felt like oh that spot is everything you know and it's still it's still a process of getting to a point where I feel that all the time and um yeah being super open there and not having to constrict and um the thing with the fucking noise stuff that's so frustrating is that it just does not just become about the noise anymore. It becomes about a hypervigilance around anything that could trigger the noise, right? So my dog's triggers have just become my triggers now because if there's something that makes her bark, then that sound, you know, and, and I'm not doing any of this consciously. This is just the body's intelligence around threat and stuff. You know, I'm just hyper aware and it's part of why I'm scanning for sensory stuff all the time is because like, I will notice something that is sometimes a thing that makes her bark. And so then there is just like a pre constriction there as a result, you know? Um, so that's why I spend a lot of time just like <laughs> finding places to be alone and be in quiet. Um, it's part of why I love uh, nighttime when everything is just super quiet and like outside is quiet, inside is quiet my dog Nyla is super tired and sleepy and much less um liable to bark at something um it's like yeah I like being in spaces where I just don't have to be like mapping any of that or thinking about any of it or working through anything I can just like relax and feel super safe and that part of me can be more relaxed and um yeah it's just it's just a process of um there's always an ongoing process of deciding what am I like working on and working through and what am I like, oh, can I just set up some parameters and containers to not have to fucking worry about that and do the things I want to do and have fun and relax and do my work uninterrupted, do really focused work where my awareness isn't split between like what noises are happening, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. That's a much more specific one than the, than the legs and hips one. Does that uh, feel like a somewhat complete picture? <laughs> really? <laughs> you this is such a trip to talk about all of this. Like, and I, I talk about all of it at once, just at such length. Um, yeah, I I just have never done something like this before, and it's so cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. It's a privilege to hear about it, friend. You described that spot as an energy wound and maybe the central energy wound in your body. Are there other prominent spots that you would describe as energy wounds? Yeah. Um, I mean, to some extent, all of it. And like, that's why when that body worker told me that my calves needed to be more flexible so I could lunge deeper, it was like, well, shit, I don't know how to do that because like, I don't think typical <laughs> interventions for flexibility are going to help me with that uh, because all of it is so interconnected in my body, it seems. And like, I always wonder, like, are other people's bodies so emotional and like just full of all of this like meaning gravity and narrative and archetypal stuff playing out and like I know that as a society we have numbed a lot and dissociated and um 
it's hard to know that until until you realize it and start to come out of it but like so I wonder how much of it is like just uh that so many people are pretty numbed out versus how much of it is this is my body is especially this way you know and I I imagine it's probably a little bit of both because part of what I'm doing in the world is so related to this I think um I mean at least so far what I'm doing in the world is so much about figuring out this puzzle of my body and mapping it so it would make some kind of sense if mine also just has like a lot more of like this energetic stuff going on whatever energy is but um that one in the back of the neck you know I think there's like multiple ones there um um there are some interesting things in my hips in like hips are a pretty general term um uh at the bone level i think um on both sides of the pelvic bowl there's like um there's this part of the pelvic bowl uh, bone called the iliac spine and like the iliac spine on both sides for me there's like something interesting going on there and I'm always feeling into it and teasing it out and like playing with them with touch and getting to know what's going on there and it's I don't know yet what the what the wounds are but um yeah I'm making progress on them and then again there's like there's so much woven into all of this because I played soccer for about 20 years and I was very right leg dominant and so that really had lasting impacts on my body in terms of muscular development flexibility range of motion body awareness how much awareness I have on each side um yeah restrictions and things injuries and so I think I used to say like well I was so right leg dominant it makes sense that like I have all of this um I have a lot of issues on my on my right side with my hip a lot of that's that's yeah like I mentioned earlier a big part of why it's uncomfortable for me to sit and I can't sit cross-legged on the right I can on the left I can't on the right I can't sit on the ground um and then at some point I realized like, well, maybe there was already a reason there in my body that led to me being so right leg dominant in soccer. Like, I think I just thought like, oh, I was really lazy as a soccer player and I never developed my left leg. I just wanted to go with the thing that felt better and felt already good. Why would I bother, you know, developing my left, my left foot at all? Um, which is not, not great in soccer. Um, I had a, I was, I was, I was reaching out to a college coach at one point when I was in high school and I sent her a video of me playing because she couldn't see me play in person. And she said to me that I was the most right leg dominant player she had ever seen in her coaching career. (laughs) So, um, you know, I was really unusually, uh, right leg dominant and, uh, you know, that could be some kind of underlying, like energetic thing, genetic thing that predisposed me to leaning really heavily into my right side and so that's kind of been an interesting process for me to like tease out is um oh there's actually something really interesting going on the left side here that's very vulnerable and quiet there's like a definitely an energetic wound there it's like it's just not like loud and I can still you know sit cross-legged on that side I have more range of motion there but I have there's been a pretty big shift there in my understanding in terms of like there is some very deep thing on the left side it feels ancestral to me that's sort of an intuition or yeah it's it's an intuition that's come through for me that it's not something from my lifetime that um it was there already and then some of the right leg dominance was just about protecting that and 
leaning away from it and just letting it be. Um, but then obviously just developing my right side so much and using it so much. I mean, I played soccer so often for so many years, like then there's going to be all of these kinds of like compounding effects of that. But, um, my knees I've been working with a lot more lately and that's another one like my calves where they feel a bit um foreign to me they feel very quiet and shy and like um they really need to be um sort of courted and approached gently and listened to and just the feeling that there's going to be a lot to work with when they start to open up more um I used to have, I haven't thought about this in a while. I used to have a really gnarly one on the right side of my back, like a little bit below the um, uh, shoulder blade. And it, I think it's, I think it's gone. I haven't felt it in a long time. Could always come back around at some other, at some other level, but like, oof, that one was tough and it took a long time. And I think it's, I think it's resolved now. Um, Oh, there's like, this is another core one. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, I don't know if it counts as core if there's like multiple, but there's one in my pelvis that is like very prominent in certain situations. And um, I just started to think that it might be in my uterus, but I can't say for sure. I know that it's very close to my bladder because um, <laughs> it starts to like, when it's, when it's really like lit up, I just start to like have to pee all the time. But then I'm like, wait, I don't actually have to pee. My muscles are just confused. It's like, there's like muscle tension. And then that gets confused with my needing to pee signal. And like those muscles get tired. And then I'm like scared. I'm going to pee myself because the muscles are tired. Um, so that one, how much do I want to talk about that one? It's very obviously shame related. Um, it's, yeah, it comes up very strongly for me. I think it comes up most prominently and most often in situations where um, I'm with someone who I think has a similar situation. I think they have a similar pelvic wounding around shame. And um, maybe it's a common one. I don't know. Like, when I talk about all of the mapping I'm doing and stuff, I really don't want that to come across as like that I'm doing some kind of mapping of like, I have a shame wound in my pelvis. So pelvis equals shame on emotional map. Okay. <laughs> like, um, I, I never want to be, um, limiting the like incredible diversity and nuance and individuality with all of this stuff. And I really don't like when that kind of thing is imposed on me. And it is just, it's never right or uh, nuanced enough um, when it happens. So, um, you know, I like it as suggestions and ideas and stuff, but I don't like it as uh, some kind of definite mapping. And I don't like people feeling um, isolated or um, confused by maps that don't match their experience or trying to like uh, trying to bring maps into their experience instead of exploring their experience um so all of that is to say that i do find that there se there seem to be i've noticed this much more with with men um there's there are certain men that i will spend time with and it, this wounding will come up very strongly for for me, it will like light up very strongly. And um, I can think of a woman that happens with too, but like, you know, stuff like that, I don't get the same kind of confirmation that I do with like, I'm thinking somebody pops into my awareness and I get a text from them. It's a pretty clear, like, okay, yeah, I did read that correctly. They were thinking about me or like interacting with my energy in some kind of way. That kind of thing when I'm like, I think I'm resonating my shame, pelvic shame wound is resonating with this person's pelvic shame wound. You know, that's more of a 
the theory and a little harder <laughs> unless we're really good friends or something it's a little harder to like <laughs> you know corroborate that one um or it could just be people who carry a lot of shame anywhere you know it's just sort of in their energy generally maybe that um will bring that up for me or if I'm doing something very vulnerable like I took uh my first acting class recently and I, I think this thing came up like <laughs> it's just like my pelvis shut off basically is my like how it felt to me energetically just like like um um what would the expression be I don't know just like barricaded itself and then I really noticed that in my voice also um the connection between like the pelvis and the vo- you know my voice pretty inconvenient in acting class where I'm like trying to read lines and um you know uh perform in front of people in a way that they can hear me and I'm already nervous and it's my first time ever doing this and then like oh I'm losing my voice great <laughs> um so that one I started getting some very clear insight into recently and the um narrative piece of it is very uh core like but I don't want to yeah I don't want to talk about the details of it but um it's a really interesting one I kind of wish that I could but uh There's a lot of stuff in my back, various parts of my back. It's kind of this funny duality where it both feels like um, stuff around being supported and then also stuff, this came up in a conversation with a friend recently. He pointed out like, it's in some ways it's the opposite with back stuff. It's like just being able to stand up for yourself, whether or not you have people with you, you know, it's like being able to fight for yourself. And um, people talk about, like, having a backbone or being spineless, for example. Um, So all of these qualities of, like, showing up in the world and, like, being myself. But then I also, with a lot of my back stuff, there really does feel like a quality of, like, well, are my friends standing next to me, my people, my friends, my family, whoever, you know, just, like, standing next to me with their hand on my back, you know? Is that, do I have that kind of support also? So sort of, like, support of myself my showing up for myself and standing up for myself and then are there are there people beings around me that are that are also um that have my back um there was another sort of meaning one that I wanted to share oh yeah this might be a little intense to say but it also feels important to say I think that like lots of female bodies have this and maybe maybe lots of other bodies as well, but like there is just an incredible amount of um, violation energy that comes up in the pelvic area. Um, And yeah, just to like work with that regularly. And then, you know, I go get another body work session and it comes up stronger and deeper in other parts. And I think that I hold this pretty, I hold this somewhat lightly, but my meaning making there is we have a lot of that kind of societal karma um you know leftover karma that not that it's not also still happening now but I think there's a lot of I think a lot of that was not for my life um yeah let's see There's a pretty thick one in my throat that has been coming up more recently. Uh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. My throat felt incredibly blocked energetically for a really long time to the point that I didn't know it was blocked because it was so blocked. It was just that was my it wasn't like half blocked and half open or I might have noticed the blockage more. I think it was just so blocked that I thought that that was what throats felt like. Um. And one time I did like an imaginal journey with a friend and I think he noticed and he 
imagery that he got was like it was dark it was like catacombs or something i don't remember but it was like uh yeah your throat is just like offline like has been forever um and yeah that's been like a developing story but i don't i don't i don't have as much of the sort of meaning side of that one That feels like a good place to pause. Hmm. Are there any other spots in your body or aspects of your somatic experience that if you didn't mention, you feel like someone, perhaps your best friend, wouldn't know you very well? Wait, I kind of missed the question. Can you say it again? Well, part of the reason I want to talk to you about this is to understand you better. And I'm wondering if there's any other aspects of your embodied experience that, like, if you didn't mention, you would be remiss to leave them out that, like, are like, oh, gotcha. if, like, to know Jane and her experience of her body, really got to talk about this. Ooh, I love that question. I, I made some notes. Let me look at them. Ooh, there's a couple things. And they're not so much like I want to tell you a story about this specific part of my body. They're more um, just body stuff that I think is super cool. And um, one of them is okay i can tell which one i want to talk about first because i was going to talk about the other one and then i was like and i'll just rush through that one to get to this cool one so i'll just start with the cool one something that i find a lot in my body exploration is um the way that let's see it's like a lot of what i'm doing is examining assumptions in my body and I don't mean conceptual assumptions, but there's that too. I mean, you know, I'm always finding beliefs and I'm like, whoa, I believe that. Obviously, I believe that in some kind of really deep embodied way. Let me work with that. But there's other kind of assumptions too that are more non-conceptual, non-verbal, physical, energetic and they're so interesting for me to work with. I think they're so fun. And I don't know if I've ever tried to describe this before or maybe once. So let's see how this goes. And just as a preface, I think I love this aspect of the process in part because I love examining assumptions. And it's a cool connection to my past. My, my previous career <laughs> was being a software developer which in a lot of ways I think of as being like an assumption examiner, because if you make faulty assumptions or, uh, yeah, you will like get bit in the ass all the time writing code if you're making assumptions about um, what you are writing in the code. Like if there are things that it's like communicating with somebody and assuming that they're going to understand you. And so you don't have to say it like you can't do that with code or um, assuming the user is going to be using the code in a certain way and then they use it in another way. And so the code breaks like, yeah, software developers have to get really, really good at uh, examining assumptions and knowing what's true and being really like specific and clear. So um, I used to do assumption examining as a career basically in this like conceptual assumption way um and now I'm doing it all the time in terms of this more embodied physical energetic assumption examining and so what I mean by that is like there will be these places that I find in my body that um feel like me feels like there's some sense of self there and I don't notice that 
until it like releases and it's gone and it's like oh that me it just disappeared I guess that wasn't me um or even if it doesn't like release or dissolve but if I just my sense of myself shifts in a certain way with that part of my body I just sort of like it's like the physical version of examining the assumption of asking the physical like say it's in my left hip there's a spot in my left hip that feels like me and then I just suddenly sort of relate to that left hip a little differently I'm like wait like it's it's almost like stepping back a little bit we're just like turning and looking at it from a different angle and being like whoa that's not me that's just part of my body <laughs> um and I don't know if that makes sense at all but I'm doing that all the time and part of what a big part of my toolkit I think of like the practices that I do are practices that allow me to make those observations and examine those assumptions and for other people they seem to like doing a lot of people like doing faster stuff or like like more intense or strenuous kind of even within yoga say they like doing a pretty like intense yoga or they get a lot of creative expression from doing like fast paced dancing or something. And for me with this type of process that I'm describing, it just, it, it seems like to be effective, it has to be very subtle and kind of like quiet, like still or quiet. So I do a lot of like standing meditation. I do some yoga and it's just very simple, very simple. And um, so really simple postures, very focused on the breath and just very focused on like feeling into my body in these ways of like, what parts of my body do I um, lean into and develop identity around? And I guess this would map to, you know, IFS parts, although I think of IFS parts as having emotional components and this would not always have an emotional component. Um, what else would it map to? I think, I think when I started getting really into these explorations, there was this thing of like, oh, I am my body. I don't have a body. I am my body. Okay. I get it now. And then later on in the process, it was like, oh, I am my body, but I'm also something more than my body. Um, and this really, the the time this was most prominently clear to me was when I was getting a really bad massage at the time, not that long ago. Um, she was just, she was doing like, I guess they were good techniques and stuff, but I'm really energetically sensitive. And there are things about her energy and the way she was approaching me and touching me and relating to me and relating to my body and I just felt like there's so much lacking in terms of her level of sensitivity and awareness and energetic channels that just felt very closed to me so um what was really striking about that exchange was that let's say she was working on my calf it felt like she was nowhere near me the thing that feels like me she was so far away from she was all up in my tissues and she was nowhere near touching me because of her presence and what was online and what was offline for her. And I didn't really realize until that moment how much of what feels like me is like not my body, but it's not not my body. It's not separate from my body. It's this like thing that swirls all through my body and includes the physical structures of my body and is also all of this immaterial, um, energetic, emotional emotional meaning rich stuff that's happening and she felt so far away from that and that is what really feels like me but there's all these places where that gets mixed up with like habit patterns in my body and the last thing I'll say about it is that um 
this seems to happen a lot in parts of my body that I move from. So a big part of what I'm trying to do in my process is move more freely or like more naturally. And I don't know much about the Alexander technique, but I imagine there's a lot of overlap here. It's yeah, my very basic understanding of Alexander technique or some aspect of Alexander technique is you're like letting your body do what it already knows how to do without micromanaging it unconsciously. Um, and yeah, I apologize to Alexander Technique people if that's not a fair representation, but like, um, I am trying to do that too. And so like, I've been feeling into this question recently of like, where do I walk from? Where do people walk from? Where does one walk from? Like, where does that movement start? Or that's not even a, a full enough question. Where does the momentum of the walking come from? Where does the action of the walking come from? Where does the, um, the whole thing come from? Like, does it come from? Um, the feet? Does it come from the ground? Does it come from the hips? Does it come from the ankles? Does it come from none of the above, all of the above? And just feeling into that while I'm walking. <laughs> Can you see why when people are like, so what have you been up to lately? I'm like, ah, oh, shit, all this weird stuff. How am I gonna, how am I gonna give any kind of normal answer to that question? Um, yeah, so uh, feeling into like, where do I walk from? What is the least micromanagey way I could walk? How does my body want to walk? If it could just, if it could just walk as naturally as it wants. How does my body want to walk? How, it already knows how to walk. Can I just let it? And that's when I'll notice that these, when I'm walking more effortfully or managing it more, um, that is where there will be those spots in my hip that feel like Jane. So they've sort of taken on this form of identity and they're like needing to exert in some kind of slightly unnatural way and control the movement a little bit. And not like that's a really bad thing, you know, I think, um, I don't want to be like idealistic or perfectionist about bodies or how they're supposed to work or whatever, you know, and like, it's fine that it's fine that, uh, you know, I don't walk completely perfectly or whatever, but it's really interesting for me personally to examine these specific, um, illusory senses of self in my body. And when I started to notice this, I asked, I think I assumed it's probably like that for most people that they have all of these little identity spots in their body that they're not aware of or are aware of. And I mentioned this to a friend of mine who is very in touch with her body and very like energetically aware, et cetera. And she said, ah, my version of that is relationships. Like the way that I naturally am, I just get lost in relationships and have all of these sort of false senses of self built into the structures of my relationships. I was kind of blown away by that because that's, so different from the body thing and also makes some kind of real intuitive sense to me that um we're all so different and um our little identity mix-ups and things would happen in all kinds of different ways but um yeah I would love to maybe like develop my I have such like a visceral sense of what I'm describing here and I don't know how much of it came across or like how clear it was but yeah I'm realizing it would be fun to develop my way of speaking about that more to try to communicate it because it's like one of my favorite things about this process and there's always this little like this sense of like surprise and wonder and awe at finding those spots and then doing the little step back whether or not if there's tension there whether or not that tension releases just disidentifying a little bit is this like tends to be this beautiful expansive kind of awe-inspiring experience for me even if it's a really minimal internal move involved in like oh i'm this i'm this like wider thing not that not that little spot in my hip and this little spot in my shoulder and stuff. What if I could just sort of relax into that other thing that I am?
want to come back to something you said earlier in the conversation. You were talking about a sense of time, and sometimes things are very prominent at a given chapter of your life, and sometimes you have a sense that you'll work on something later on. What contributes to your sense of that? That it's not a now thing, it's a later thing? Mm-hmm. There has to be a momentum. Um, there probably doesn't have to be. Uh, there are ways, I imagine, of just being like, oh, let's get with some of this really dense tissue in the low back and see what's happening. Like, I've I've worked on that spot with, with a body worker who I really like, who's, she's super deep and uh, energetically attuned and stuff and we you know we did some interesting work but also it was just there was sort of a feeling at the end of like oh there's just a tangled web of something in there um so I don't like to I don't like to make some kind of decision of I want to work with this spot on my body because it would be convenient for how I think my life needs to be i I really am trusting the process of how there's there tends to just be a really beautiful timing and flow to how they naturally come onto my radar to be worked with. And I guess it's hard to describe how I know when that's happening, but that's just sort of the muscle of intuition that could apply to anything that is in this instance being applied to whether it's time to work with something or not. But yeah, I find that momentum is very important in this kind of work because otherwise I'll just be banging my head against the wall with something in my body. And like, it's not good for me. I don't I don't want to waste time. I don't want to do this stuff obsessively. I, I do other stuff than just explore. <laughs> um, and I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to obsess about it. And I want to be efficient. And I want to like really respect my body and do what my body wants to do and not impose some idea of what needs to be the next thing. And it's just a pretty clear sense that it is not time yet for my back and it will be at some point. And it's going to be so beautiful to like open that up more and have more feeling there. And just like, ah, oh, it's so prominent and central. I mean, I don't have much connection with my entire skeletal system, unfortunately. Like I do this thing sometimes where I intention, I sort of like meditate on it or just specifically set the intention of like, feeling into my skeletal system and it is different it is like a qualitatively different experience than what I'm experiencing moment to moment experiencing my body and there is there is a sense of a lotness to it it's like I don't know if I can handle this much bodily awareness just being able to feel everything including all the way through the bones it's like this is a little overwhelming. How long are we going to do this for? Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I touch into it in parts. Like I mentioned, um, my iliac spines, like working with them a, a teeny bit here and there. And they're also like real sensitive. And that's a, that one's a slow burning project. But um, yeah, so I think, you know, I will get to a point where I'm working with my whole skeletal system more. Uh, and then it will make sense for the spine at some point there will be some kind of momentum to get into those lower back tissues I think like, like I don't know the physiological side of this if it has to do with like well once they're getting more blood flow to those tissues then it'll just be easier for me to work with or something like I don't know if that's what it is I don't know if it's a blood flow thing I don't know if it's a chi thing I don't know if it's something else entirely or a combination of things um but yeah, there's something about being like, here, pick this random, really dense spot to work with. It just doesn't go very well. Against the wall situation, it ends up being more of a tip of the iceberg situation versus like, um, yeah, this is a huge part of my process, actually. And it's a little hard to talk about. It's like, I'm always trying to get underneath a thing. Um, and then directionality is weird so maybe it's not underneath it maybe it's like I was saying before with the energy signatures if I can 
feel a distinct energy signature, I can usually be separate from it rather than lost in it. I don't like being lost in some of my stuff and like just like uh, endlessly looping on just the tip of the iceberg and then there's still the whole rest of the iceberg. So I've like developed more savviness around realizing where whether there is enough momentum, like enough of a way in with that part of my body that I will actually be able to like see the iceberg or like be able to work with a really big chunk of it or something and I don't have that sense with those tissues in my back or my spine um but then you know it's something where like it it's still good for me to do just not back bends not full back bends but just getting a little bit more extension in my spine here and there and just like you know just gradually work at that a little bit and not push it at all but just start to open things up there and then as the momentum comes towards that area through its own intelligent timing that I don't have a window into you know there'll be these little these little bits of um help that I've given it along the way that will bear fruit but um was there something else I wanted to say about that iceberg thing that's actually like a really juicy piece of it for me that I've never tried to put into words before um what else do I want to say about that oh I just think that this is a way that like I and others can get totally fucking lost like not lost but just loop on shit for a long time that it doesn't need to it doesn't need to be that much work it doesn't need to be that much time and energy it's like I don't know if you've ever had this experience with like a therapist or a practitioner of any kind. I've had this experience a number of times where we're like kind of hashing something out in an emotionally aware embodied way. We're working with like some anger or fear or something. And then the practitioner just does some kind of brilliant move where they just, you know, using their own awareness and their own presence and their own sort of hard won experience they sense into there's a deeper thing here that is more important and it's where we should be and they sort of hold my hand and take me to this other vantage point in my experience where I can now see that thing that I was going to be I would have just done a whole hour session working on that thing and talking about it and feeling into it and then they're just like nope there's this deeper thing can you come down here with me okay see that thing now that thing's irrelevant now now we're at this thing this is the thing that that thing was protecting. Now we're with we're working with this thing. That thing doesn't need to be there anymore. And it will just like slide off. And then I think to myself, like, holy shit, how much time could I have wasted just doing that thing? And like, wasted is a strong word. You know, this is all just like a process and a figuring out and stuff. But it's a really important value of mine in this exploration and work that I'm doing to be efficient. Um, yeah, I have like, I have four values that I have sussed out in what I want to be um, sharing in my energy work and body work. And then in my, my teaching of what I'm doing is I want it to be effective. I want it to really work. I want it to be efficient. You know, I want it to work efficiently so that we can just do shit fast and we're not wasting people's time and money. I want it to be lasting. I don't want the changes to just evaporate. Um, you know, I want this work to be meaningful and and lasting and, and improve people's lives. And I want it to be beautiful. I don't want it to be totally result driven or process driven or a slog to get through. I want it to be something that I feel really connected to and passionate about and eros -y. Um, So yeah, efficiency is really important to me. So um, it's this thing that I'm always dancing with of like, part of it is finding ways to like give my system momentum and that's when it will really run the show is if it has some good momentum like when I did that Reiki the other day that Reiki energy that got channeled in the session stayed with me for the rest of the day and it just was figuring stuff out you know I wasn't having to direct it tell it what part of my body to work with it's just and I was working with it you know I was very aware of where it was and what it was doing and I was helping and 
um, collaborating with it, but it, you know, it knew what it was doing and it didn't need input or direction. So, um, and I think that's available for me. Oh, like it doesn't have to be channeled Reiki energy. I can just find ways, whether it's eating well, whether it's spending time at the ocean, whether it's um, practicing, doing yoga and standing meditation, things that are like chi balancing or chi activating really get momentum going for me in those kinds of ways. So it's a dance of getting momentum going and then also being wise about where I direct my awareness and attention and how I'm working with the spot so that um, I'm getting underneath stuff. I'm getting fuller pictures of what's happening there. When I move it, it really moves. It doesn't just come back later. Um, yeah. You also mentioned almost a sense of milestones in the future and like, oh, it'll be great if I can just sit comfortably, for example. And I wonder if there are any other milestones like that that you're aware of that you're hoping for in the future. Definitely. What are they? And I also have like hit some pretty big ones. Um, um, there is this, uh, I don't love this language, but like, I think sometimes about what it means to have a healthily functioning emotional system. And what I mean by that is that generally somebody, or I'll keep it about me, if I'm in a situation and I'm interacting with people, there's always going to be emotion flowing. But is the emotion that's flowing, does it sort of match the circumstances that we're in? Because I think I think our emotional systems are incredibly wise and meaningful and important and um, being really in touch with that and able to work with it on the spot is like a superpower, I think. And I feel pretty good at that, but mine still has so much backup, um, you know, or like less now it's, it's getting so much better. Like you'll hear people say things a lot of the time like oh you just have to feel your feelings and then you know a feeling never lasts more than eight seconds or I don't know whatever however long people say and then it's just gone you just have to feel it just feel it bro <laughs> okay yeah it's not like that for everyone but thanks it's cool that it's like that for you uh that's one of my pet peeves and I I feel like I hear that one a lot um and yeah, there's just so many uh there's so many um alternative <laughs> there's so much cobbled like together in my emotional system and I think other people's emotional systems that keep it from being this like quote unquote healthily functioning system. Um and I can feel that really changing with time. Like I just wrote this blog piece about um, directionality of experience, like whether I'm feeling myself kind of from the inside out or perceiving myself from the outside in, like seeing myself from an outsider's perspective and how I've been like playing with that sense of directionality and opening out more. And like, that's been really big for me and I've only been able to do that very recently because of how much work that I've done to work through the really deep, ever-present buckets of emotion that were with me all the time that prevented... It, it, I couldn't just be feeling my feelings all the time because I would be having totally fucking inappropriate emotional responses to everything, and I would be overwhelmed all the time. Like, oh, I should just feel my anger. Okay, like watch that bug out. And then I would also like, I would just totally blow my fuses if I tried to feel all my anger all the time, you know? So it's like, it's been this process of like chipping away at that in appropriate ways and sort of managing all of that. And there's a lot of complexity and nuance to that. 
I think it's going to be a huge milestone when I do feel that more um, healthy, balanced uh, flow that is more like appropriate for the present time. It's like there isn't so much of the past in it and so much about future expectation and planning. It's sort of just present moment emotional stuff and then I think it will be more like that thing that people talk about where you just you know it's there and you feel it and it passes except for the ones that have a purpose that they really need and then that one you need to do the thing and then that passes um so that one I already feel like I'm celebrating it to some extent because I can just feel in the last month or something how much closer I am to that one. And it feels so good. It's like, um, I can name and recognize so many more emotional signatures now. And that's because I'm not living inside of them anymore, or I'm not living inside of them to the extent that I once was. And that feels so good. Every time I sort of strip one of those layers out of my um, default awareness or something, And then, you know, work through it, release it. I worked through a huge layer of guilt recently. And like my moment to moment experience is pretty different because of that. Um, So that's a big one that like healthily flowing emotional system. Yeah, I think the main one, this, this goes along with the sitting comfortably is like feeling arranged in space comfortably. Um, So it would be kind of whatever posture, whether I'm standing, walking, sitting, laying down. Um, Yeah, my body doesn't get to feel that very often. It's not that I never feel good. Like I'm in modes where I do feel really good. Like I'm, it's just more like, it's a little less super in touch with everything happening in my body and more in touch with like an excitement and passion about what I'm doing. And then my body, my body feels good, you know, whatever this stuff, this stuff, all the mapping and stuff is just on hold and the tissues feel good. And, you know, I still have my tension patterns and um, my postural stuff and all of that, but things feel good. So yeah, I don't want to make it sound like I never get to feel good, but I don't feel comfortably and effortlessly arranged in space and I think that it will be so beautiful and amazing when I feel more like that and I think it's I think it's in the cards for me and I think it's still um you know it's still a ways off I think this is part of why this is my project is because that's what I'm working towards and that's a way of really honoring my body I I think is like not in some kind of obsessive way or measuring myself about like or I use the word project with hesitation because I think that that could sound really bad and I don't mean it as like I'm not good enough how I am or I can never be um I can't accept myself as I am but um I mean it more in the sense of like uh I'm so grateful for where I am and also there is this wider project that's happening And I think that project is in service of a lot of things. It's in service of um, building a unique system of maps and models and teaching and energy work or body work or whatever, whatever form it ends up taking. Um, And it's also just very much in service of me and feeling good and giving my body the comfort and, um, giving my body the um the opportunity to experience like effortless organization and um real openness real openness with life real intimacy with life all of my body just being so intimate with life and with experience because i'm not constantly worried about fucking triggering the energy wound in the base of my sternum you know like whatever happens happens and it's all just open and I don't have to micromanage how I walk and I don't have to 
plan around um, getting triggered and um, yeah, I can just do other life stuff and uh, things are good here. And it won't mean that I won't, I'll lose interest in exploring my body and my my embodied experience. But um, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say with intuitions, you know, why it feels like this will happen and that won't happen. But that really like feels in the cards for for me and my body at some point. Is there anything else about your experience of your body that you'd like to say more about or dive more deeply into? I had thought that I would talk about this more, but I think I'll just give a really quick version that's like, I've talked a lot about meaning, meaning gravity, meaning uh, like narrative, archetypal stuff um, that I find when I explore my body. And I'm intentionally talking about that with a lot of import and reverence because um, I think that's a really important aspect of being alive and being a body and being in a body and um, being a human. And there's a way that I feel it either either offline in a way that people aren't aware of that being a possibility or actively sort of denigrated, discouraged, looked down on, um, made to feel like it's not real, um, that really bothers me. Um, I mean, if people don't, don't have that online, don't, don't know about it. Like that's, you know, that's, that's whatever. I don't like, I don't like getting body work and energy work from people that don't have those channels. I, yeah, channel, I mean, I'm, I'm using that language kind of vaguely or metaphorically, but people who don't have those channels open, um, I don't like getting body work from them, even if they're really great body workers, which is really interesting that some people can work at an incredible, incredibly subtle level with the tissues, but it's like a quality of their touch that I can feel, and it's a quality of our connection that I can feel that that part is not there. And that's such a big part of how my body works and processes and um, exists that uh, I get so much less out of those sessions and they're bland and boring for me. Um, so I would rather receive touch from a friend of mine who doesn't do body work, who has his channels open than receive touch from a super skilled body worker who does not have those channels open. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to like talk about story and meaning a lot in this interview because I think it's a really important part of being alive and um, making meaning in life. Maybe it's more obvious to people outside of their bodies that making meaning in life is very important but it's just as true with the body I mean the body is like the portal and the landscape for everything so how could it not be true for the body and like just because it's ineffable or like hard to pin down or hard to draw lines around or hard to put into words or my experience of it is different from your experience of it doesn't make it less real um so it's my little pitch for story and meaning there's a way that some people I think can act like um this yeah maybe your body needs to do that to process your trauma and then one day you'll see that it's all fake it's all not real it's all bullshit it's all just trauma stories or um it's just stories um so I'm not trying to um I certainly think it's possible to get too wrapped up in narrative and lost in it and also um I would never have been able to do what I'm doing with my body and gotten so far and deep in this process if I hadn't started to take very seriously that like there are these stories that have played out and have been are, are playing out you know kind of through my body and it's not like I don't have any 
I'm also writing the stories and telling the stories and it's um like a a a collaboration or like a co-creation of the stories but I think they're yeah I think they're very real I'm glad you stand for that we've talked about this before but uh I really value that as well and as you can tell from me having you on I'm very interested in the somatic experience and phenomenology but I think also yeah meaning and sense making are really important and I'm glad you care about that as much as you do awesome anything else you'd like to talk about no wow this is like yeah maybe my vulnerability hangover is kicking in I'm so mm. curious to listen to this back I have kind of no idea what I just said for the last couple of hours great but, stuff um, is what you said cool cool awesome glad to hear uh I don't think so it was so much fun uh yeah it's so cool to have an opportunity to just like really flesh some of this stuff out and like I think I said this a number of times I a lot of this stuff I've never tried to put into words before um so that's always a great exercise and enlightening and telling um is there anything that you think that we've missed Just what you said just now, um, I think I've really valued how much you try to put your experience to words and how much you try to make sense of what you're experiencing and connect the dots with it. And a lot of people will maybe prefer to have almost mythologies around the path where it's like ineffable or not something you're supposed to speak about or not something you're supposed to put models too. And um, I'm sure there's values in that approach, but I have always found speaking clearly and precisely about our experience and what we understand to be happening to be really helpful and um, interesting and, you know, motivating, but also I think practically useful. And so I'm just glad that you are trying to do that. And it feels like a privilege that you've shared some of these things with us. And uh, that I get to hear this. So thank you. Mm, yeah, you're so welcome. Thanks for the interest and in, um, platform and amazing questions. Such good questions. My pleasure, friend.